This is 9-11 Free Fall. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of 9-11 Freefall. I'm the host, Andy Steele. Tonight, I'm going to be joined by Ted Walter and Tony Zambodi. They're going to be talking about a number of things, including the upcoming Justice in Focus event, which is taking place on and around the 9-11 anniversary this year. Uh, We've talked about it in previous episodes. They're going to be giving their own insight on that and uh, what we can expect from it. They're also going to be talking about a mailing that AE 911 Truth is going to be putting out this year that's going to be going out to engineers across the country, laying out some of the problems with the official explanations that have been given to us uh, regarding what happened to the Twin Towers on September 11th, the official explanations based off of the theories proposed by Zednik Bazant. So Tony will be going into greater detail about that, uh, so stay tuned. Uh, just a quick a heads up, there was a problem with the microphone, my microphone this week, so I had to go with the uh, original raw recording of this, so that's why it's going to sound a little old school, that's why my end of the conversation is not going to be as crisp as you're hearing me here. You can hear me clearly but unfortunately technology is not cooperating with me this week so it's going to sound like a little bit like i'm on the phone but i think you guys can handle it i think we can push through it because it's a great interview so we'll be back to top-notch audio quality in the interviews next week i assure you all right stay tuned the views expressed on this show by guests and the hosts on issues outside of the 9-11 controlled demolition evidence are the opinions of those individuals alone and do not necessarily reflect those of architects and engineers for 9-11 truth I am joined today by two very great, dedicated 9-11 activists and researchers. Uh, The first one is Ted Walter. He's the Director of Strategy and Development here at AE 9-11 Truth. He was the Director of NYC CAN's High Rise Safety Initiative and Campaign Manager for AE's Rethink 9-11 campaign a few years ago. He's also the lead author of the book, Beyond Misinformation, What Science Says About the Destruction of World Trade Center uh, Buildings 1, 2, and 7. And um, he's joined by Tony Zambodi. Tony's a man- mechanical engineer from the Philadelphia area. He's got over 20 years of experience in the aerospace industry. He dist- designs structures for aircraft, spacecraft, and support equipment. He appears in 9-11 Explosive Evidence Experts Speak Out. He's been a frequent guest here on the show doing lots of great things, standing up to the false official story that we've been fed by NIST and uh, supporters and we're going to be talking about some of the great stuff that they're going to be involved in and the AE is going to be uh, doing in the near future as well. Guys, welcome back to 9-11 Freefall. Glad to be back. Yeah, it's nice to be back, Andy. So there's a lot of stuff to go over today because there's a lot of stuff that you guys are engaged in and which AE is going to be a part of in the coming months. Uh, we're going to start off with this open letter to Zednik Bazant that is right now at ae911truth.org in case the listener wants to read it. Uh, But, Tony, why don't you start off talking about that? (coughs) Sure. Um, It was written in June, I guess the third week of June, and uh, the reason I wrote it is I wanted to be sure that Dr. Bazant was fully aware that there had been... um, a couple of discussion papers submitted to the Journal of Engineer Mechanics that had been um, rejected as out of scope. And bear in mind, these are papers discussing a paper that Dr. Bazant wrote that was published at a Journal of Engineer Mechanics. So it doesn't make sense that it would be out of scope. It's discussing something they published. But that's what they ultimately did after quite a lengthy period of time in the case of one of them. And the other one, uh, <clears throat> they had rejected as being too late, and it wound up being turned into a paper that was uh, submitted later to the International Journal of Protective Structures and published. 
Uh, both of them concerned critiques of Dr. Bazant's um, papers that were published by the Journal of Engineering Mechanics concerning the World Trade Center collapses. He feels they were natural and that there was there were dynamic loads, and that's what caused the structure to collapse. Uh, what he does, and uh, he he um, there are errors, for lack of a to be polite, I'll call them errors. There are a number of errors in his papers uh, where he says there uh, you wouldn't see a, a deceleration, which is required for a, for a dynamic load or amplified load which you need to take down a structure that can support several times the load above it, the static load above it. So he needed to know that these papers had been submitted, and there was no way of knowing that uh, because the journal, uh, we don't know that the Journal of Engineering Mechanics would have told him that they were ever submitted. So I wanted to make him aware of that, and that we, there are those of us out here that are saying he had errors in his papers, and we'd like them to be corrected. And that's why I sent the letter. And again, our, our listeners can view that at AE's website. And your whole story about submitting this paper to the journal is actually documented in the Beyond Misinformation booklet. I think I actually read that specific section here on the show at one point several months ago because it is so, so interesting to see the level of professional censorship when it comes to this critical issue that we talk about here on this show every week, the controlled demolition evidence revolving around the Twin Towers in Building 7 on September 11th, and the complete fallacies in the official story, stuff that is easy to measure, easy to observe, uh, anyone can grasp with just a simple uh, explanation involving basic physics, uh, and it seems like it should be easy to have a discussion about one of the most critical events to happen in the 21st century so far, and yet when people try to have these civil conversations, uh, either in person or by submitting them to journals, they get shut down and people don't want to hear it. They just want to move on and act like uh, this happened 15 years ago and it's not still affecting us today. Ted, since you wrote about that issue that Tony had with trying to get the paper in the journal in the Beyond Misinformation booklet, I want to get your take on that and also on what uh, Tony's talking about here with the open letter to Bazant. Yeah, sure. So uh, Tony and I have been working together since, uh, I would say the early spring of 2000, uh, 2010 yeah. when we started uh, lobbying uh, members of the New York City Council together, um, educating them about the collapse of World Trade Center Building 7 um, and trying to galvanize them to open an investigation at the city level um, by the New York City Council uh, into the collapse of Building 7. Um, and so we've been working together since that time and uh, in, in, the, in the later years after that, um, Tony was keeping me up to date on, um, you know, his work uh, as far as, you know, s submitting papers to, to various journals and in particular his critiques of uh, Zidonic Byzantine analysis. Um, and, and so when he submitted the, the discussion paper um, of Byzantine's 2011 uh, article, uh, you know, we basically... You know, he submitted it and we started waiting and, you know, hoping um, that, you know, that it would be published, pretty much expecting that it would be published um, because, it, after all, it was a you know, valid analysis and it was directly related to Byzant's um, article. Um, and so, yeah, Tony, Tony kept me updated throughout that process. Um, the paper was essentially stonewalled for, you know, more than two years. Um, it took 27 months um, for them to get a final decision on on their paper being published. This is Tony Zambodi as, as well as Richard Johns. And, um, and finally, 27 months later, uh, the editors told them, and there was, a lot, there was some back and forth in between, but 27 months later, the editors told them that the, the, the paper was being rejected as out of scope, um, you know, which, is, which is a ludicrous uh, excuse. Um, and, and the paper is so important. Tony's discussion paper is so important because, um, you know, 12, 13, 15 years later, uh, Byzant's analysis is, is the sole analysis um, that supports the official story, and in particular, um, the, the idea that the towers could have under, undergone a total collapse um, and at the rate that they did, um, you know, by way of a natural progressive collapse. Byzant is the only person, the only engineer in the world um, who has, you know, tackled that question and attempted to support the official story um, 
NIST uh, completely sidestepped that question um, and really made no secret of, of doing that. Um, they were very explicit in saying our investigation ended at the point of collapse initiation. Um, and so Byzant really picked up where NIST left off. And if you can refute Byzant's analysis, you basically have refuted the official story. Um, and so that was the gravity of what was going on. And I think ultimately the underlying reason why, why Tony and, and Richard's uh, paper met such resistance at the Journal of Engineering Mechanics um, was that if, if that if their discussion paper had been published, it would be essentially review, uh, refuting Byzant's analysis and, and refuting the official story of the collapse of the Twin Towers. Um, and so I, I cared a lot um, while all that was going on. I, I you know, really cared about what was going on with it and um, was really disappointed and frustrated, um, you know, when Tony learned that the paper had been rejected. And, you know, given, given the weight of the situation and, and, you know, the ramifications, you know, I really felt that this, you know, this, this story needed to be told. And I felt that the engineering community needed to know that the Journal of Engineering Mechanics had, had wrongly rejected this discussion paper um, and, and, and get the information out there. Uh, and so we, we, we took the first step. You know, other things have happened. Other, Tony's, Tony's done stuff and other people have done stuff. Um, as far as architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth is concerned, we took the first step of, of getting that information out there uh, last year when we published Beyond Misinformation. So as you just spoke to, there is that little, you know, that um, section of, uh, of, of Beyond Misinformation where, where we re recount Tony's story. Um, and, you know, we go in Beyond Misinformation, we address the lack of deceleration of the North Tower's upper section as, you know, one of the most important, if not the most important piece of evidence um, that, that the Twin Towers were brought down by controlled demolition. Um, and so uh, since Beyond Misinformation, um, you know, we, we, I, I, there has been a desire since, since 2013 when the paper was finally rejected to really um, get this information out there and make the engineering community aware of what had happened. Um, and, and so this is t what we're working on now is, is sort of the next step of that. Um, Tony took, took a nice step with the open letter to, to Dr. Bizant. And, um, and now we are, you know, in, in the, the process just about there of, of publishing, uh, this new document, which we call World Trade Center Physics. Well, yeah, it's interesting, you know, World Trade Center physics, it should be physics for everybody. I, I know what you mean, and the proper physics that should be applied to the situation, but it seems like we got a whole new set of physics here on the day of 9-11, and when you have a political agenda attached to an event, physics changes. It doesn't really matter uh, what these what stood as uh, principles of science and physics for so many years. If there's a political agenda attached to it, we can just look the other way. We can close the reports off for public comment after a certain time and just turn our, our eyes away from it and use it as a shield for politicians to no longer have to even uh, fulfill their responsibilities and use their own brains when asked certain questions like, how does the top part of a building crush the lower part without decelerating? We actually asked that of two congressmen on C-SPAN one time, and of course they had nothing to say about that other than to dismiss it as uh, conspiracy theory, typical answers uh, for most of the people when they were questioned about this, and this is a problem. The physics doesn't change just because you got a political agenda attached to a certain event, and that's what we are facing here. That's why what you guys are doing is so great. Uh, why we need to stay focused on this issue, even as time passes and new things sprout up that take people's attention, uh, by just sticking to these basic rules and showing uh, like institutions like this journal uh, for what they are and for their unwillingness to uh, have a real discussion on this, the censorship, exposing that just through uh, your actions – is doing a great service for this country that is going to be looked at in the future and remembered, you know, and we're going to try to prevent this from ever happening again once this gets exposed. And I think your story is going to be really studied and what you guys had to go through with this basic, simple argument. Now, uh, I want to get to that uh, World Trade Center physics uh, document that's going to be getting sent out. But before we do, you, you see this in the open letter, Tony, uh, it is sincerely hoped that you will correct these errors now that they have been brought to your attention. Once they are corrected, your analysis can no longer be used as an argument against a new investigation to look into those things which were missed in the first to in uh, attempt to investigate 
these collapses. This is the open letter to Bazan, just to clarify for the audience. So what would be the proper way for Bazan to do this? to come out and just basically say, yeah, I was wrong, or write a new paper uh, explaining why he was wrong? How do we do this in the science world? I think he can do it either way. Um, I'm sure there's a there's a procedure, um, you know, just nothing more than just a, a newspaper writing a retraction. I'm sure if he went to the Journal of Engineering Mechanics and said I was incorrect, somebody called my attention to it, he'd be allowed to write a correction paper of some sort. And I'd like to see him do it. And, you know, that's that's why I notified him. You know, we're, we're <clears throat> the other things are we're going to be brought out. Um, professor, it's, by the way, uh, Richard Johns is a professor in, uh, I think, uh, in, in Vancouver, Canada. And uh, another uh, colleague, uh, uh, Gregory Zolodinsky, which who was the main author on the other paper, um, is in Australia. He's, he's a PhD mechanical engineer. Um, you know, Professor Bazant, he had to be made aware, and um, you know that was the reason, like I said, for the uh, for the open letter, because these other things were going to come up, and we were going to start saying this stuff is wrong. And I didn't want. It's sort of like I wanted them to hear it first and have a chance to do some corrections. And I haven't gotten a response. So I think that tells us what his intent is, unfortunately. Yeah, and the, the more that we have to bring it to everybody else's attention as opposed to the people who have been pushing this false official story for years doing it, makes it worse for them because uh, it's going to make the impact once everybody wakes up to this even more uh, more crushing for them and their reputations. It's better to just own up to your own mistakes and and deal with it, I think. Uh, it's just a smarter thing to do, but of course this is 9-11 and everything that uh, is going on now in the world is, is spun off from that in some ways. There's a lot more at stake here than just simply debating uh, the properties of a fungus growing on a log in some forest. I mean, there, there's major uh, political and money ramifications, too, for the economy and all the companies that made money off of the post-9-11 world. So I would like to see him come forward, but I can't imagine there's a lot of pressure for him not to. So let's talk about this mailing we're planning. We'll start with Ted. Tell us a little bit more about uh, this World Trade Center physics document and where it's going to be going out to. Sure. So the the document itself, uh, one of the one of the good things about it is that, being that it is is the now the 15th anniversary of 9/11, um, amazingly 15 years later, um, you know th- this document is kind of marking the 15th anniversary, and it's it's basically using this moment to to reach out um, far and wide to tens of thousands of members of the engineering community. Uh, to bring this information to them, um, and and so whereas last year beyond this information, which was um, you know a very important document providing an overview of the most important evidence regarding the World Trade Center destruction, um, that didn't have any sort of like special moment attached to it. There wasn't like a, a direct call to action in it. Um, this document, World Trade Center Physics, has a direct call to action um, in the form of a letter. Uh, by 20 civil and stru- structural engineers um, who are architect who are petition signers of architects and engineers for 9/11 Truth, um, basically, you know, calling upon the engineering profession now, 15 years later, you know, to finally reckon with this issue and to finally to, to finally say enough is is, is enough, um, and and to begin, um, you know, in, in in concert, you know, questioning uh, and challenging the official account of the collapse of the Twin Towers and, and 9-11. Um, and, uh, and so we're going to be sending this document out to 35,000, well, oh, more than 35,000 civil and structural engineers in the first week of September. Um, included in that will be um, hundreds of members, uh, a, you know, members of the American Society of Civil Engineers, um, which is the institution that the Journal of Engineering, Me- Journal of Engineering Mechanics is a part of. And so we're going to be we're going to be mailing this document to hundreds of members of the ASCE who are you know basically in the leadership of the ASCE are you know serve on committees that are you know directly relevant to the destruction of the World Trade Center 
uh, you know, forensic engineering committees, uh, structural engineering committees, tall building committees, uh, things of that nature. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, so we, we really, you know, I think we feel that this, um, that this will really, you know, move the dial, um, within the engineering community, that this is going to give people, some people who perhaps already agree with uh, us and understand what really happened to the buildings, um, kind of the courage and, you know, to, to come forward, the, the confidence that, you know, there are, there is an organized effort, uh, among engineers and architects to, um, resolve this issue. Uh, and, and, and so, yeah, we're, we're, we're really excited about it. And, and beyond that, beyond the letter and beyond, you know, how many, you know, the sheer, you know, magnitude of the number of people we're going to be sending it to, um, this document really, you know, you know, blasts apart the, the official narrative and, and Byzant's role in, in propping up the official story. Um, it starts with basically the background, which is that NIST, um, as I touched on before, uh, NIST stopped its analysis, stopped its investigation at the point of co collapse initiation so that they didn't actually analyze and try to explain all of the phenomena that occurred um, during the 10 seconds of each building's violent disruption, um, which is really the 10 seconds where you have um, a, a ton of data, which is very important for trying to figure out, make sense of, of why these buildings came down. Um, and, uh, and, and so NIST did not try to explain the total collapse of the towers. In other words, they did not try to explain why, if you assume that the upper section of each tower could begin to fall uh, due to weakening from fire, uh, that the top section of each building could crush through the 90 stories below it um, at near free fall acceleration. And as we have discovered in, after years of analysis, never actually decelerating. Um, in the case of the North Tower, which we can measure uh, very accurately, um, it never decelerates, which means there's, there's no dynamic load. The, the upper section is not um, impacting the lower section and, and, and crushing it. Um, and so we, we go into, once we establish that NIST did not um, try to explain that, um, we NIST, what NIST did do was offer up the the analysis of Byzant, which you know Byzant published or submitted this paper two days after 9/11, um, trying to explain why the the towers came down completely, um, and and so we then we get into discussing Byzant's work, um, and we we kind of uh, outline the history of Byzant's papers, um, and then the papers that Tony and other people. Um, have published, uh, whether in the Journal of 9-11 Studies or elsewhere, uh, refuting Byzant's analysis. And then um, we, we get to the actual paper that Tony wrote, the discussion paper, uh, that was rejected by the Journal of Engineering Mechanics as being out of scope. That's the third section of this mailer. Um, and so finally, this very important paper um, is seeing the light of day, you know, is going to be read by tens of thousands of engineers. Um, and I'm pretty confident that, like, when when all these engineers receive this thing in the mail, like, it's going to grab their attention. You know, it's not going to be your your J.C. Penny magazine. Like, this is uh, this is an interesting thing that you're it's going to show up in people's mailboxes. So I, I'm pretty confident that a lot of people, a lot of our target audience, is going to read it. Um, and so yeah, we're we're really this you know this like very simple like four page paper is essentially <coughs> blowing apart the official story of the collapse of the Twin Towers. Um, and, uh, and then we go on in the, in the latter sections of, of the document to um, outline the other, you know, corroborating evidence, uh, overwhelming evidence of controlled demolition, such as the eyewitness accounts of explosions, the molten metal and the debris of all three buildings, the molten metal, metal pouring out of the South Tower uh, in the seven minutes leading up to its collapse, uh, and, and the discovery of, of nanothermite in every, uh, dust sample that was studied by a group of scientists. Um, and, and then we get into the, the collapse of building seven, um, which, you know, amazingly out of these 35,000 engineers that are going to be receiving this document, I would, I would wager at least 50% are not even aware of the collapse of building seven. Um, that was what we found when we went to, uh, the structural, um, 
what was it, the Structural Engineering Summit in Las Vegas last October. Um, it was a conference of just structural engineers, and an alarming percentage of them, more than 50%, uh, were, not, were not aware that a third building collapsed on 9-11. Uh, and so that's where we are. Um, but sending out this mailer to 35,000 engineers uh, will, will move the dial significantly uh, just in the number of uh, engineers who are aware of the collapse of Building 7. Um, and that, that right there is a huge step forward. Um, so that's, that's the whole document in a nutshell. Well, and I think it's so funny when people say, oh, you've only got uh, 2,500 architects and engineers, actually over 20, 20, closer to 2,600 now. I don't even have the official count at this moment, but it's growing. Uh, but they'll say, oh, you've only got that many architects and engineers, but then you go out and talk to architects and engineers, and a lot of them don't even know that there's a problem with the story. They don't even know about Building 7 existing. I've never watched it fall before, and I, I say this all the time. It's probably getting tired. I don't care, though. It's like doctors not knowing about the Black Plague. I mean, this is a huge structural failure, and if you believe the official story, how can they not study this? Well, when they study this, they got to know then that there's a problem with the story because a lot of them end up uh, agreeing with us and agreeing that it does should be looked at again at the very least. I love this whole thing, too, about stopping at collapsed initiation. It reminds me of this episode of Seinfeld where uh, one of the characters would just say yada, yada, yada through a big part of the story and then come to some crazy conclusion at the end. Uh, you know, it's, it's like going out and, and saying, I, I borrowed your car and, uh, well yada, 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 it's in a ditch, you can go get it. I mean, there's a whole big important part of the story that's not told in the middle there. And in this case, it's explaining how this top part crushed all the way to the bottom and just took out the entire structure. And then you got to look into the lack of deceleration and how it couldn't have even crushed all the way uh, to the bottom. So if they don't want to do that, they're just going to stop there and not go any further and use excuses like, oh, well, this is not a, a criminal investigation when they are asked to look at certain aspects. They did that with Building 7. I have no doubt they would use the same excuse if asked and put on the spot uh, about the Twin Towers, too. So this is why we got to exist and why we got to keep on doing what we're doing. The fact that we've come so far and been able to present resolutions at AIA, for instance, or get these um, mailers out to people at ASCE and such places is not with any help from the establishment organizations that we're dealing with. It's all from the uh, elbow grease of volunteers and people who are passionate about this issue and rightly so. And of course, brilliant people like yourselves raising these arguments and, and uh, taking the leadership roles and implementing these things. Uh, Tony, can you just comment about that stopping at collapse initiation? Because I want to hear oh, your yeah, thoughts on sure, that. Sure, sure. Well, you, you can look at it in three parts, and I did explain this a little bit. Uh, I talked about it in my letter to Dr. Vazan. Uh, and this stops, in the case of the North Tower, we'll use that. That's the one we can measure real well. It didn't tilt that much. They stop at the uh, where they say the south wall, which is the opposite side that the aircraft impacted, the complete opposite side, 207 feet on the other side of the building. They say <clears throat> that uh, trusses were heated and pulled in that the exterior columns, causing them to buckle, and they stop there. They don't even go so far. Not only do they not talk about the vertical progression, they don't get into how it, the horizontal propagation across the entire building occurred, which is pretty rapid. If you think that if you realize this building had 47 core columns and 236 uh, exterior columns that all had to fail for this thing to start coming down, and it happens in less than a second. You can time it in video. You can you can see when the southwest corner and the northeast corner start falling. Now that is a diagonal across a 207 foot square. It's, a, it's just under 300 feet. That Those failures of those, those parts of the building start moving within one second of each other. That means 247 and 236, that's 283 columns had to fail. If you take the ones out that were hit, but this is the 98 floor. There was almost no damage to the 98th floor, and that's interesting, too. NIST admits that it's the 98th floor. They don't talk about the horizontal propagation other than to say it started on the 98th floor. That's where it initiated. The 98th floor was above the aircraft impact, so the thing started failing above the impact. The impact 
occurred, the nose hit between the 95th and 96th floors, and the aircraft was pitched downward at about 10 and a half degrees. So the 98th floor, the wings were rolled up by like 25 degrees. You have very little damage, so you have to ask yourself right there, why would it start on the floor that had no impact damage? Well, it did. And there was fire there. I'm not going to say that, but the columns were intact where it started. So about 283 columns need to fail. They don't get into that. They jump from the south wall fail to Professor Bazant's paper, which is basically on the, he just said the columns were overheated. Initially, he said they were 100 degrees centigrade. He had to back off that. It's pretty hard to do. Um, That's about uh, 1,400 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, He had to back off of that because he didn't have evidence of it. And this didn't have any evidence of any columns that were heated higher than 600 degrees C, and that was only three spots. They had no evidence of any temperatures above 250 with a little bit of steel that they received. So they just jumped from this south wall, exterior wall, purportedly buckling, they say, and then um, to Professor Bazant's paper, which talks about a dynamic load, which when you measure, like we were saying, you need a deceleration to have a dynamic load. Uh, It's an impact, like dropping a glass on the floor. The reason the glass breaks in that case, and not when you place it on a table or even place it on the floor, is because... It's experiencing this other acceleration, which or deceleration, I should say, um, which that's multiplied by its mass and added to its static weight. So it actually weighs a lot more. When you do the mechanics, many times it'll bend and break or, or fracture. But that's what you need because the buildings are built, in the case of the Twin Towers, the core columns had at least a three-to-one factor of safety, meaning they could they could uh, support three times what was above them. And the exterior columns, because they needed to take wind and seismic loads in rare cases, under gravity loading, they had a factor of safety of over five, meaning only 20% of their capacity was being used. So these buildings were seriously robust. And, you know, you're not going to defeat that that reserve strength without a major impact and an amplified, what we call an amplified load. Um, but that requires deceleration when it's measured. It never decelerates. It's like it's just falling through the rest of the building with minimal resistance that couldn't handle the static load. So it, it looks like about 90%, 85 to 90% of the structural integrity is being removed for it to fall. It only has about 30, 35% resistance. And if you have a three three times factor of safety, that means it can handle 300% of the load above it. So it's about 80, 80 to 90% of the structural integrity is removed, and the upper section just falls through without ever slowing down in an impact. Because when you have an impact, you're going to lose velocity. You're transferring kinetic energy. And you have an impulse, and, 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 you know, it's an impulsive, what they call an impulsive load or dynamic load. I, this is definitely something that engineers across the country need to hear, and uh, we have this problem that a lot of them are not hearing it from the professional organizations that should be caring about this stuff. Uh, and so a lot of them are, are not likely listening to 9-11 Freefall every week, so we got to bring the information to them, and we need all the help that we can get. Uh, Ted's got the document ready, and there was a notice sent out to supporters telling them about that, what are some ways that eager volunteers or people who can just kind of do a little bit at a time because they got busy lives uh, but care about this issue, what are some of the ways that they can help us out with this effort, Ted? Well, as you mentioned, uh, we sent out a, we've been sending out bulletins for the last uh, almost two weeks, uh, fundraising so that we can afford to mail the document, print it, uh, well, rent the list, so that you know, these, just getting access to these 35,000 mailing addresses costs a little bit of money, uh, print it, and uh, mail it to all 35,000 people. Um, and if you look at those three costs, the, mail, the, the list rental, the printing, the mailing, um, basically it adds up so that it costs us a dollar per engineer, which, is, which I think is a, you know, very cost effective uh, to get this out to 35,000 engineers. Um, and so we've been fundraising and, um, we, we're, we're, I think people have, you know, this, the, the project has been very well received. 
people are very excited about it. Um, at this point, we've, we've raised probably 80, 80% of what we need, um, and our, our goal is to get there by Saturday. Um, so, so things are going well. We're, we're, you know, at this rate, um, all signs, you know, point to the fact that we're, we'll, we'll be able to, to do the whole mailing to all 35,000 engineers. Um, so that's fantastic. So if people want to make a, a small donation, whatever they can afford, um, if you're able to donate $25, um, then we can uh, also send you a copy of the mailer uh, directly. Um, you would receive one, you know, through the same, you know, the same channel as, as all of these engineers that are receiving it. Um, so yeah, uh, in the future, uh, we're also going to be, uh, in the, the very near future, we'll, you know, we'll make it available as well for anyone who actually wants to, to get copies of it uh, to hand out locally, um, whether to their friends uh, or to go to a local college or university or, or what have you, um, you know, and we're, we're basically making those available at cost because um, it does cost money to print the, print the brochures. So this is a high value, like very, very cogent um, type of brochure, you know, slightly more expensive than printing, you know, two, two or three pages of, you know, basic information. Um, but I, I think it's really worth it for the outreach. Um, you know, we, we followed that model with Beyond Misinformation, and, and you know, it seems to have been very effective. We we basically succeeded in uh, distributing uh, over 50,000 you know hard copies of Beyond Misinformation last year, uh, and so we're we're hoping to do the same um, with this document as well. And and so um, we'll we'll also make the PDF available, um, and that that'll be totally free. And so people can download the PDF, read the document and email it to as many people as, as they can and, you know, post it on online and, you know, uh, altogether we can get this information out there so that literally hundreds of thousands of people are, are learning about this. Yeah, I'm excited about this, and we got a really ambitious agenda ahead of us. A lot of work to do here at AE911 Truth, but it's worth it because we're reaching a lot of people through our efforts. We always need volunteers because uh, we're going to be getting this to other people throughout the year. This mailing is just the beginning, folks, because this is, uh, as Ted said, the PDF is available. We'll make sure other people get it as well, whoever uh, we can get to read it. And uh, when you put it in this kind of format, it's short, it's concise, it gets the word out um, with as much detail as is needed to make the point, but without going overboard, anybody can read it. Uh, in a short span of time, something like this is perfect. So, uh, you know, if you can donate just a little bit, help us reach the goal, uh, then that'll be even better. Uh, we can uh, we can move forward and use this uh, for future outreach too. It's definitely a big worthwhile project. I want to switch gears right now because we, got, like I said, we have a lot to cover this episode, and we got another big thing coming up. I've talked about it. In previous shows, we're going to talk about it uh, again today, particularly because Tony's here and Tony's going to be presenting at it. Uh, but the Justice in Focus event is coming up. So I want uh, Tony first, we'll start with you, to just uh, briefly give us a preview of what you'd like to talk about down there and just your overall thoughts on the goals of the Justice in Focus event and uh, you know what, what you expect uh, will, will come out of it. Yeah, I mean, I was asked that, uh, I guess as a team of lawyers, uh, Ted might be able to shed more light on this. They got together with architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth, and this event's being put on. It, somebody sponsored it. It's in a big hall at the uh, Cooper Union in New York City, and <clears throat> essentially uh, the technical people like myself uh, and Richard Gage and I think Dr. Leroy Halsey will be there from the University of Alaska, who's doing the uh, finite element study of World Trade Center 7, basically we'll be giving evidence to this team of lawyers. And um, in addition to educating people that are there um, who may not know much about it, but that's the gist of it as far as I know. Um, I was asked to come up a few weeks ago, and I guess it's only a few weeks away now. Yeah, and you're going to be taught. What, what you, what's going to be the crux of your oh, presentation? Yeah, and the crux subject? of my... Yeah, well, <clears throat> uh, Building 7, I've gotten involved in uh, in looking into the uh, the NIST, I should say, omissions, distortions, and and, uh, and ig ignoring of pertinent structural features, <clears throat> excuse me, that would, if included in their analysis, would, uh, would have uh, prevented the failures that they say occur. They would make them impossible. And... <laughs> It's fairly straightforward that 
these things wouldn't fail if these items were included. And I'm going to show that to the lawyers and why. Um, in addition to that, the Twin Towers, this whole lack of deceleration thing is going to be brought up and explained. And that's basically my, uh, that'll be my contribution to it. Right. One great contribution added on to so many others. It's a big name event in terms of researchers and experts that are going to be here uh, bringing what they have found about the World Trade Center evidence and presenting it just like yourself and Leroy Halsey, as you mentioned, that's going to be huge as well. Uh, Ted, I want to get your take on justice and focus. We had Richard Gage on the show several weeks ago here to talk about it, but since you're the Director of Strategy and Development here at AE, I know you've been uh, working really hard also in putting this together and getting it planned, so give us your own synopsis on how it's going with Justice and Focus and what you expect from this event. Sure. Um, so as far as I understand it, I think I think that the goal of Justice and Focus uh, Conference is to chart a path um, uh, towards uh finding you know resolution and closure with this in in the legal realm um which means uh either uh through criminal prosecution or through a civil lawsuit um holding accountable uh the people uh who were behind 911 uh to put it simply um or through through perhaps even other means um you know per- perhaps international uh, criminal court uh, if, you know, local and national uh, legal remedies uh, are exhausted. Um, and so, the you know, the keynote speakers who are going to be there uh, are Ferdinando Impossimato. He was He's the honorary president of the Supreme Court of Italy. Um, he he was very involved in, in, in um, prosecuting crimes related, related to Gladio um, and the strategy of tension uh, in Italy. Um, and, uh, and so he's going to basically bring his insight on this. And I, I think he has felt, um, for, for several years, uh, he was actually one of the, the judges at the, well, I don't know if judge is the right word, but, um, for lack of a better word, judges at the 9-11 Toronto hearings, um, on the 10th anniversary, uh, since then he has, he, he has been, you know, trying to bring 9-11, um, to the international criminal court. Um, or, you know, pursuing that strategy. And so I think he's going to speak about that um, and speak about the parallels between uh, 9-11 and, and the crimes that he was uh, responsible for prosecuting. Um, and then there's going to be Daniel Sheehan. Um, he is a, a public interest attorney uh, who's worked on many high-level cases um, related to, like, political uh, events, political scandals, the Iran-Contra affair, um, the uh, uh, among others, uh, Silkwood, um, and and a few others. So, uh, and he again, he's going to be drawing parallels. Maybe not so much in the nature of the crimes that he's looking at, but um, you know, just from a from a legal standpoint, you know, what lessons can be learned from from the cases that that he's brought in the past, and um, you know, and 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 I think he really, uh, as far as I understand it, you know, he Daniel Sheehan is is relatively new to looking at the 9-11 issue and is, is trying to bring his expertise and his experience to bear at this point and helping uh, the 9-11 truth movement uh, chart a path forward uh, legally. Um, and, and then that's, that's what this other group of lawyers is, is all about. And I think we'll be uh, collaborating with Daniel Sheehan and, and the second day of the event, um, there will be other speakers and, and panelists on the, on the first day. Um, there'll be something about the 28 pages. There will be uh, a panel that discusses the, you know, the, the Mujahideen all the way to the current day ISIS and, you know, the forces uh, behind all of that. Um, Richard Gage and Dr. Leroy Halsey will also make presentations. Uh, Dr. Halsey is going to basically present his, his preliminary findings or his, his progress to date of his, um, as Tony mentioned, the, the, the finite element. Uh, modeling of a World Trade Center Building 7. Um, so that's all happening on the first day. And then on the second day, we have the Lawyers Committee uh, for 9-11 Inquiry, which is, um, you know, a group of lawyers that is, is, is working on that very issue of trying to chart a, a path forward legally. Um, uh, and I think that their goal of having experts like Tony and, and Dr. Holsey and Richard Gage speak is to 
listen, you know, hear the evidence directly from these technical es experts and sort of comment on its, um, its strength and its admissibility uh, in a court of law. And, and, and they, will also, they will also have their own panels on Sunday where they're talking about things like legal standards in, in different jurisdictions um, and, 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 and a few other topics. Uh, and so that's really, that's the goal, the goal of the conference, again, is to, you know, to chart a path forward uh, legally, um, justice and focus. Uh, so, so that's, that's it. And I think it's, it's time for that. You, you know, we've, we've, we, as a, as a movement, you know, we've come a long way in 15, in, in 15 years. Um, but the clock is, is also, you know, is ticking to have, if, you know, to have meaningful resolution where, you know, r revealing what happened on 9-11 has, has a, a, a substantive impact on how our country is governed and our policies. Um, and and so it's it's time to bring justice into focus um and 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 you know this this conference is it's a good time to do that and and i i expect that out of this over the next five years um we'll see very vigorous efforts uh to do just that you know pursue pursue the issue of 9 11 in a legal setting absolutely and uh, to speak to that need for justice because one of the problems that i run into when i talk to people is they'll say oh my god it was 15 years ago it's over uh you might have a point but why look back at that those people are long gone and it was terrible what happened to them but it's been 15 years you know let the dead rest and let's just move on as a country and i want to start talking about this in every single episode with each uh guest uh, because there's some news that broke this week. I'm just reading a headline here from Democracy Now! It says, health officials, number of 9-11 linked cancer diagnoses is tripled. I'll just, read the, I'll just read a paragraph from it here. It says, in New York City, health officials say, the number of people who have been diagnosed with 9-11 linked cancers has tripled. Nearly 5,500 first responders and local residents have now been diagnosed with cancers linked to the toxic smoke and dust of 9-11. That's up from fewer than 2,000 cancer victims in 2014. Health officials have called the increase alarming. And I want the audience to meditate on this fact. Right, nobody got cancer from the planes hitting the towers. They got cancer because somebody set explosives in those buildings and brought them down and pulverized them in midair and filled the air with all those toxic chemicals that were in those buildings. That's the reason that they have cancer, and it's not even the first responders that were uh, on the rubble pile. It is people who just happened to be there that day. I, there was another article somebody quoted me about a freshman in college who's got cancer now as a result of uh, being a freshman in college in that area on the day of 9-11. All right, I believe you were a freshman in college when 9-11 uh, happened, Ted. So this poor lady has now got uh, cancer here, and it's because somebody set explosives in that building. So this is not an issue that is just over and done with in the past and let the let the dead rest. There are people who are suffering now. 9-11 is still going on for the people who have cancer. And so that's why we need to have justice and why we need to pursue this issue. And if there's any questions about what happened to these buildings, I'm speaking to the engineers out there right now who may be uh, checking out the issue. If there's any questions about this, we need to get to the bottom of it. If not for the people that died on that day, then for the people who are suffering now uh, from the very real uh, evidence here that uh, not from the evidence itself but from the act of putting explosives in those buildings because that's what the evidence shows. So I want your comment on that and the, on the cancer issue and the importance of this issue in relation to that. Just your honest opinions uh, or just your, you know, how you feel even if this is the first time you heard that. Uh, what's your take on that? We'll start with Tony. Yeah, I uh, certainly people are still getting ill uh, is, you know, these things lie dormant or latent. It just breaks down your system earlier in life. Um, from what I understand, there was carbon nanotubes uh, found in the lungs of, uh, of certain people that worked on those piles, and the carbon nanotubes can be traced to, uh, to the use of thermite, according to Dr. Neil Sarrett. Um, so they certainly breathed in things that you wouldn't normally breathe if uh, some type of incendiaries and explosives weren't used in those buildings. In addition to all the asbestos that was in there that was blown all over the place. Uh, that's not good. We know that's not good uh, as a society. So um, whoever committed these crimes, 
was not concerned about that. Um, and there's still effects, not just from people that got ill from the effects of the buildings coming down, but wars, you know, where people were told, were told that these wars are because of 19 hijackers when, in fact, those hijackers couldn't have set those charges. It's certainly terrorists that took the buildings down. The question is who the, who were the terrorists? And it, 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 it stands, it, it's very much, uh, cl it's very clear that some of the terrorists who took those buildings down are still at large, and perhaps even in positions of power. So um, they're still making, possibly making decisions that affect our everyday lives, in addition to all the people that are still getting sick and maybe hurt, innocents hurt in an unjustified war. Ted, what's your thought on this stuff? Yeah, well, I was, you know, I, I was pretty startled when I, like, you know, read read the articles, you know, within the last week about how cancer cases uh, had tripled um, from just like four or five years ago. Um, you know, that's that's a huge that's a huge surge. Um, and and you know, it's it, it's very very simple. You know, like the victims of of nine eleven are are not only the people that that died um, that day, but also the people who have died since from cancer and from other illnesses. And the people who have cancer now, um, you know, who, who may die as a result of that sooner than they would otherwise. So these are all all, all the vict victims of, of the September 11th attacks. And regardless of whether you link, um, whether regardless of whether you link their illness specifically to the like, uh, you know, absorbing or inhaling uh, the actual explosives or you know, nanothermitic materials. Uh, or if it's just linked to materials that are, are native to the buildings, regardless, um, those people um, would not be ill were it not for the, the demolition of the Twin Towers and Building Seven. So, whoever did that is responsible for their for their illnesses and their and and the people that have died, and um, and you know need need to be held responsible. And you know, like you said, um, it's. It's still relevant. Um, we have, you know, five thousand people now, or, or in, that, in that ballpark, who are who are suffering, uh, you know, from cancer as a result of of what happened on nine eleven. So, it's um, it it even without that, it would still be relevant. But that just adds so much more to it, and we need to think of those people. That's you know a part of why we we do the work that we do. I'll just add one other thing to that, Andy. Um, you know, it's sort of like the old when the wolf's at somebody else's door. Some, you know, as as the old old uh, tale went, you know, the one guy didn't wasn't concerned because the wolf wasn't at his door, and then when the wolf finally did come to his door and his neighbors didn't come to his aid, he asked him why. Well, you know, he wasn't helpful with them. So I mean, you know, you're supposed to look out for each other, and this kind of thing, you know, we can't tolerate that mass of a deception and. Um, or any deception like it, you know, with all the all the horrors uh, that go with it, all the domestic deaths and and uh, like I said, unjustified wars also, and ongoing domestic deaths and and deception in society. If we don't know what the reasons for this was, um, you know, if, if it's not clearly admitted what the actual reasons for those buildings coming down was in an official sense, um, I just said one more thing. Everybody says 15 years. It took 15, about, well, 12 years, or 13 years, I should say, to get a new investigation into the Kennedy assassination. And that happened in the House of Representatives in the late 70s, after the showing of the Zabruder film, which I think the, the video of Building 7 is just as powerful. Um, so we should be getting a new investigation, and that may happen uh, with this, this uh, these legal people you know, these lawyers uh, coming in and going to bat on it right now. Hopefully that kind of thing will happen. And I guess as a final word, Tony, what do you have to say to the engineers out there who just don't want to get involved? They just say, hey, you know what, you might have a point, but I just, I'm, I'm too uh, wrapped up in my own thing right now, and I just can't even get involved in something like this. Well, I, I would say that no one person has to do it all. You know, just lend your voice. Just open your mouth. Oh, you should speak up if something's wrong. That's all they have to do. They don't really have to do a lot of work. Okay, they can they can, you know, read a little something, 
and and open their mouth and, and voice their opinion on it that this is wrong and something needs to be done. That's all they need to do. And something like this mailer that uh, the that AE911 Truth uh, just recently came up with is a key to hopefully a lot of them doing that, just becoming aware. They're just not aware. You know, this hasn't been in the news, and they need to be made aware. And once they are, they should pipe up, you know, sign the AE911 Truth Petition, and and just make it clear that they're aware that there's something wrong, and it needs to be investigated. Ted, in our last minute, I'm going to get your take on that, too. What do you have to say to those engineers who just don't want to get involved? Well, um, you know, what we say in the World Trade Center Physics Mailer is that, you know, we, as as the building professionals, as the engineers um, who were alive, who were practicing professionals on 9-11, who watched those towers come down, um, that we have a responsibility. We owe it to the people who died um, and to the people who've died since and to future generations um, to just, you know, to speak up and to, to correct the record on this, on this very uh, important event. Um, Cause we don't want to, we don't want, you don't want to let it get away. You don't want to let, you don't want to leave it for future generations to reckon with what happened on nine 11. You know, let's, let's get this settled now. Um, and, and so like Tony said, you know, we're not asking you to go out and give a hundred presentations. Um, we're not, you know, we're, we're asking for you to just speak up, you know, understand the information, share it with your friends, your colleagues, sign the petition at Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. The more people we have, the more petition signers we have, the more credibility we have, the more, and, and the more people that we have talking. Um, so uh, we, we really, you know, let's get, let's do this and not let it go on to future generations. You know, the people that were alive on 9-11, like, it's our responsibility to, you know, to try to fix this. That's right. And as I noted earlier, people are still dying from it, and people who did absolutely nothing but be in Lower Manhattan that day. That is atrocious. That will not stand. Uh, that renews my energy to do something uh, even more with this, obviously. And, uh, you know, that's, that's what I'm going to keep in my mind. And that's what the engineers and all of the great citizens that make up this country should have in mind moving forward. And that's why we need a new investigation. Guys, you are kicking butt out there. Keep on doing what you're doing. I can't wait to get more updates. And uh, good luck. And thanks for coming on 9-11 Freefall. Thank you, Andy. Okay. This program is on every Thursday night on No Lies Radio at 10 o'clock Eastern, 7 o'clock Pacific. You can also keep track of the archives by going to 911freefall.com. This is Andy Steele saying have a great week and good luck.